Okay, I'm closing my windows. <clears throat> hey, friends, I'm Scott Hanselman, and it's another episode of Hansel Minutes. I'm here with Lamor Freed. How are you? Hello. I'm so glad. We were just having a good kibitz fest beforehand, but now we're officially on this podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for being here. I'm realizing that I need to start pressing record earlier because like yes. you said, we were like kibitzing for like 20 minutes. We're like, this well, should have been the show. It should have been like, oh, we, we've had a little freedom to, to talk the talk. But we're going we're gonna, to rehash some of the things we discussed now that we're all comfortable. Yes. So uh, yeah, we're here, we're here for a bit and uh, I'm Lamar Freed. So hello, everybody listening in or watching. And I'm actually, if you're if you're watching the video, I'm at the Adafruit factory. I'm actually going to do something really risky. I'm going to pick up the camera and like pan it around. Is that cool? Oh, my goodness. Let's do it. So That is risky. So, oh, this is our uh, happy Pride Month. Um, so this is the machine line you can see over there. This is our manufacturing line where we actually do uh, pick and placing of electronics. So all the computers that, and, and phones and devices that are on your desk that you love all of those go through pick and place machines. We have circuit boards that place the components on them. Um, and I designed those those boards using software. And then it's actually manufactured here at our factory in Manhattan. This is my desk. I'm in the middle of the manufacturing floor, which is cool because like my little eyeball tendrils can see everything from the you know testing zone to the kittening zone where we get the kits together to um, you know preparation to maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so this is like my company and this is where I live. This is my little bubble. When I visited there, and I'll put a link in the show notes uh, so people can look at that YouTube on the Adafruit channel, which is one of the best YouTube channels. Oh, yeah. We have tons of B little videos. People go, oh, we yeah. want, you want to watch machines, we got machines. Yeah. So I went in there and I, I was like, wait a second, I'm in Manhattan. And suddenly it just opened up into this giant like Costco like level, like, you know, giant football field mm. warehouse. And I just assumed field? that everything would be... Soccer? <laughs> elsewhere overseas somewhere and well yeah it was yeah. surprising that so so that there there is a lot of manufacturing overseas right like uh, obviously a lot of it in china but also you know the raspberry pi is manufactured in the uk and wales which is super cool uh, we do have a lot of manufacturing in the u.s but it's m now much more focused towards military or like small run or like whenever people really need to worry about their intellectual property they don't want it to leave the, the country um, so we do manufacturing here. We're actually in a building. It's cool. This building historically, um, was actually an inductor factory for Westinghouse. So this is, this actually was first built in like Victorian era era. Um, it was doing manufacturing, electronics manufacturing for the massive, and I mean massive radio industry that was in Manhattan, right? It was, it was like headquartered here or something. Everyone loved radios because they're cool, but you have to make inductors and capacitors and switches and buttons, whatever that was all manufactured. A lot of it here in Manhattan. Um, this in, this district, which I mean now, just Hudson Square, then became a printing district. Um, so like like printing presses, because the, the you need a very big floor plate that's also concrete, very strong, because the printing presses are so big and they vibrate when they go ka chunk a chunk, ka chunk a chunk. And um, so there's still a bit of printing going on here, although a lot of the printing has um, moved to New Jersey or Brooklyn and Queens. Um, this area is still a little bit industrial. It's it's one of the last zoned for light manufacturing areas in Manhattan. Um, but even now, it's it's it recently got rezoned, so there's going to be more residential. Mm -hmm. And I assume you have to have a cool relationship with the building owner and stuff. And they like they love having Adafruit in there, causing trouble. Yeah, well, they have a certificate. They have a certificate of occupancy, uh, which is for light manufacturing. It kind of gives them a little bit of like something about the occupancy is, is good if they can get light manufacturing in. They get to keep that certificate. I think it kind of keeps them from having to do in some sort of inspections or something. I, I don't know. Uh, so they were kind of happy to see that we actually are a, uh, you know, doing light industrial manufacturing here, mm -hmm. which we do. You can even hear some of the machines. That's why like people are like, "What's the what's that noise? Why isn't it like deathly quiet?" Because we're actually making stuff. Yeah, it's so it's so cool to see. Like you held up that 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 plate there. That uh, what is that right. word? Yeah, this is an um, um, ortho keypad. Um, you can see it's got five uh, five rows by six columns, and then you can um, plug key switches into it. So this is this is what it looks like. This is my prototype. So these oh, are wow. uh, Cherry MX compatible switches. So like a lot of people have mechanical keyboards, okay. but if you want to make your own keyboard, this is a grid that you can snap apart. Oh. So you can like snap, I was it, into... I could snap it apart. So I could yeah, go and make little stream decks that are totally my own and totally. Yes. That's the I'm idea. in control. 
Yes, that's the idea. So you can make custom uh, control. Uh, so you can even sort of see behind it. You can see me because it's yeah, a snap yeah, yeah. apart design. Oh, wow. And um, so that's what we're working on today. We're doing uh, diode matrix pull requests, fixes, you know, testing to get this working. Um, and then this is my prototype, which we hand make here. I hand pick and placed it. But then um, when it's ready to go, the machine will do the work for me because I'm lazy and I want the machine to do it. And pick and place is something picks up the component and then places it on the board and then... Yeah, yeah. So it. so components actually come on reels. I don't think I have a reel or two here. Um, they come on reels like in, in this is in a silver bag. And the components, it's, it's a little bit like Pez, like the little parts that kind of pop off one at a time. Hmm. They're held yeah, in a yeah. little plastic tape. And there's a machine that uses, um, it has an XY gantry and it has these little vacuum nozzles and, and sort of like, you know, when you go to, uh, when you were a kid or maybe you're an adult and you like put the straw in, um, your milk and then you put your finger on top and you lift it. It's that same concept, but with very, yes, exactly. But with very, very small components, it picks them up and places them down on the circuit board with like extreme precision. Um, but one of the things we like about this building, like I said, the, the floor is very thick. So as it moves around, it doesn't vibrate, which means it can maintain that precision. You can't, you, you know, usually these are on the ground floor, but we're actually many floors up. Um, and we can do that because the floor here is so thick because it's designed for industrial manufacturing. That's such an interesting thing. When I, when I try to teach software, and I think you do the same when I watch you teaching electronics, is systems thinking. Let's just take a moment and like drink that in for a second. Mm. The construction of your building and the stability, the relative stability of the floor and the building and its sways could potentially affect within a millimeter, half a millimeter or less yeah. oh, where, absolutely. A, where a thing gets pressed on a board and that matters to the customer at the end. Yes, because it affects your yield. So a lot like when you do, I think a lot of people who watch your show probably compile code. I actually write a lot of code. Most of my stuff is, is, is in software and firmware. And there's errors and there's warnings, right? Your compiler or your whatever it is that your, your interpreter is going to tell you like, you, you have an error in your code, but sometimes they'll tell you things that are like, well, this is not an error, but like, I don't like it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like with a C compiler, you turn on, it could be a problem. Maybe you meant to do it. Maybe you didn't or linting. Right. So the machine would work fine. You, it wouldn't error, but all those warnings, all those things that could be a little bit wrong, they can, they can stack up and cause failures in the end. Um, with manufacturing, you have this, you know, you need to be 99.9% .9 precise and accurate at each step because that multiplies out and there's like four or five different steps in manufacturing. You have the precision of the circuit board design, and then there's the precision of the stencil printer, which is what puts the paste that gets melted onto the circuit board, which when you go through a later step, it melts down and it sort of sets the pieces in place. And then there's the precision of the pick and place, which picks up the component and places it. And then there's the accuracy of the oven, which has to evenly heat up the whole thing. If you don't have even heating, um, you know, you get some parts that are hotter than others before, you know, they get hot spots. The components actually start to lift and they warp. So all of these little things together, piece by piece, um, you need to have them all, all that precision adds up to whether you can manufacture something in the end where all the things that come out of the machine are good because if you have one bad part, it can destroy an entire product. Now, luckily my parts are not super expensive, but you know, if you have um, an $800 device or $500 computer and one thing doesn't work and then it has to go into rework, it's, it's a lot of effort and you want to avoid that because that's hand labor. You want to have as much stuff manufactured because it's more fun to watch a machine do stuff than have to do it yourself. It's amazing, though, when I hear stuff like that, that anything works at all, that we're even having this conversation. The layer, the stack is so deep. Oh, no. So here's, here's system theory. It's all feedback systems, okay? And I, tr I tell people this all the time. This is one of the most important things I learned in school was our bodies and the world in general is extremely, like, it, when they say gross motion, not gross like icky, but gross as in it's very... Um, uncontrolled, like it, it, you, you don't have a lot of control over, um, or the, the nature in general, things happen very radically, right? It's like emotion and growth and activity. It's like very extreme. Like there's not a lot of precision in the output, but there's always these feedback cycles that let us regulate 
and um, improve the accuracy of systems and processes, which is like a lot of words. But let's put it this way. Like if if you're, uh, I don't know if you do like model making, like some people like paint models. If you have a brush and you you have your eyes closed, like people can train to be able to paint accurately with their eyes closed. But for the most part, if you try to draw with your eyes closed, you, you are going to have the basic shape, but it's kind of all over the place. Like the circles aren't round and like things that you thought touched were not because you can't get that feedback from your vision system. When you open your eyes, you can then actually more accurately draw. You can actually have things touch and you, you can see where things are and you can place your motor reflexes in the right location. And if you're doing really precise art, like you're doing like little miniature models, you want to have a magnifying glass, right? And the magnifying glass doesn't improve your muscle control. It improves your eyeball resolution. That feedback system gets better. So you're like, what does it have to do with electronics? Um, all the machines that we have are like, they're totally like, they're just motors flying and who knows and they get older and they get sometimes it's humid and sometimes it's hot and sometimes there's light but the camera systems are really good the vision system is really good and because the vision is so good it makes up for like everything else kind of sucking <laughs> you know like <laughs> the stencil printer makes mistakes all the time but there's a vision check at the end and it does a vision inspection it says like oh we forgot something here and i'll like blink a light and i'll say hey person we have to have more paste or um you need to do a cleaning cycle and it will actually kind of help you redo the work. So feedback systems, amazing. It's interesting that computer vision taking, in this case, adding, like it's adding additional bodies. Like you could hire a human to stare at that thing, but they get tired and all that kind of stuff. Computer vision is making older devices more precise by allowing you to catch errors as opposed to what I ignorantly would have done is like, well, I guess we'd have to buy a better, more precise device, but you, you can do so much with a good feedback system. And this is like how the this is how the universe runs. Feedback systems is what lets us do things repeatedly because you can't, you can't predict or control so much. Like there's this weird lie that when you're in school, you think everything's linear. You're like, I want to do like linear approximations. Linear. Okay. Nothing is actually linear in real life except for like conceptual math in reality, everything is so flexible and weird and affected by thousands of different variables that the only thing you can do is just have like really excellent feedback systems. Mm. Which is like a metaphor for like life and talking, taking feedback from family and friends. For everything, and everything, including programming. If you have a tight feedback loop that gives you instant good feedback on your programming, right? Which is why I like Python because it's really instant, gives you instant feedback. You can much more quickly get to the end goal, which is this program that you're trying to write. If whenever you're writing code, right? Cause when you, when you sit down, like there's this like game that I've heard, like people try to like code without a computer. They just like, somebody's like, okay, write the Fibonacci program. And they just like s say out loud <laughs> what the program is. Right. Imagine if, like, yes, and people used to do that with machines. Like, they, you'd have to punch cards, and you had no idea what was going yeah. on. You wouldn't find out until the next day. The feedback loop is so big. It takes so long that you can't have these quick iterative improvements. So shortening feedback loops is like, and, and improving the quality of the feedback is how we can do better with these imperfect, perfect bodies and imperfect, mm. perfect brains. I love I, uh, our brains and our bodies, but like, yeah, they kind of mess up a little bit sometimes. I am, uh, I'm currently and had for the last year on and off on the weekends been trying to build Ben Eater's 6502 mm. uh, system, you know, from like 7400 series parts and breadboards and stuff like that. Somewhere in the middle, something's gone wrong and it works oh, yeah. like 40% of the time. Yeah. Like literally like on a random Tuesday, I can plug the thing in and it's amazing. And then another day it's just like, eh, didn't work. Yeah. And I feel like I've missed a feedback loop at some point because it's so gross. Like it could be, like you said, humidity. It could be a yeah, wire is too it thick. It could be a wire is loose and it's, it, when it's cold, when it's hot, it's a cold solder joint. And, and mm -hmm. just depending on whether it's flexed or not. Uh, yeah. It's, it's just, Quantum the electronics effects. is, yeah. Electronics is a little annoying. But to your point about Python, this is one of your Pi portals. Yes. With my blood sugar on it. Oh, yeah. That's my real-time blood sugar in yeah. green and, a, and, a, and an arrow there. 
uh, talking to the open source system that runs my diabetes. Yeah. Um, and this runs Circuit Python, which I just plug this in and it shows up as a disk drive. I open it up in Visual Studio Code. I make the change. I hit save. And this thing starts, it just recompiles. It sees the, yeah. the file system change. That inner loop, that developer's inner loop, the for loop that is my development process allows us yeah. to go and do things. I used to have to like pull the chip off the board, flash the firmware, put the chip back on the board. Yeah. Oh. But let's talk about like the, the feedback loop that you're creating, right? Because you you have a feedback loop that you're building for your body. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So like how would how would historically, how would you know your blood sugar? Like you'd probably oh. have to do a blood you know, you'd prick your finger, you'd, you'd take the little strip and you'd like wait a couple yep. minutes. So, and so yeah. you wouldn't know until out, you know, you'd have to do it every few hours to know where you are. That's a good point. The feedback loop for diabetics, for type one diabetics is really challenging because when you're looking at your blood sugar with a finger stick, you're looking at the past. Right. So I'm asking now what my blood sugar is and I'm seeing yeah. 15 minutes ago. Yeah. And then it, I take it's insulin. Like, it's like you compiled it, your code and it's like you wait 15 yeah. minutes. Well, it's like looking at the sun and you see the light from eight minutes ago. Yeah. And then you say, all right, change my blood sugar. Give me some insulin. That doesn't even do anything for an hour and a half. So you're right. constantly living in this. Like I always imagine being on an airplane. I look at yeah. the altimeter. It's a lie. I say, pull up, pull up. <laughs> and nothing happens for an hour. And then that loop, that loop is trying to- Bad be feedback system. Not bad, but ex but extremely delayed so feedback system. Optimal. But now you have, you know, with all this technology you've got, You've got much faster feedback loop. So you, you mm. think does it, you do think it helps you regulate and kind of even out, or does I think it not? That it does. I think I, I like to think about it as I'm driving a car. I'm in a three lane highway. I'm in the center lane. I can either weave back and forth by making big gross movements, yeah, or I can do that driving thing that we do where we just kind of yeah. like shake on the thing. So. I'm still moving, but I don't think I'm moving as I'm not oscillating between yeah. highs and lows. It's less highs and less lows. Feedback systems. Feedback systems. Great? That should be like the motto of this show. That's there you go. There's the name. This is the this title of the show is feedback systems. Feedback systems are very they're very powerful. I think it's I think it's a shame people don't uh it's often taught very late. If you're an engineer, it's mm. taught very late in your career. It's just I think unfortunate because it makes it harder to understand things huge even though i don't use feedback systems i think about them do you know what i mean like mm -hmm. i think about what is the feedback loop here anyways so we're talking about circuit python oh, which yeah. one of the goals was to remove the the again 15 minute um you know f feedback loop of embedded engineering which is you know and when i started it was even worse you'd have to uv erase your chip so you have to remove the chip put it in the uv eraser <laughs> wait, you know, five to 10 minutes until it was UV erased and then you could use it. Um, I mean, the chips look cool. They were golden because they had the the UV EEPROM in them. But now, you know, when I, with, with flash microcontrollers and these very powerful microcontrollers, you can do stuff like run interpreted language. The problem is that the chips that we have now are so big that compiling for them, it's like, it's kind of like a deal. Like it takes time. Like it used to be pretty fast because they were small, but like as things got bigger and bigger, and I think I think developers see this too. Like code that people write now have so many dependencies and like so much stuff that it's like it's good because we are able to build such bigger, more advanced programs. But like there's a lot involved. It's not it's not like little DOS programs anymore. It's like hundreds of thousands of lines of code could be involved. Here's a question for you. So yeah. I was teaching some stuff to an intern, uh, you know, and I'm old man who shakes fist at cloud yeah. and they're fresh and new. Yeah. And I realized, and uh, actually Maria Nagaga on my team said that, Scott, you're teaching from the metal up. Like, let's talk about memory. Let's talk about CPU. Let's talk about assembly language. And I go up from Silicon up. Yeah. But the new people think about Chrome, the, the glass on the monitor, and they go from the glass back down into the computer. So they're thinking about the user surface, mice, keyboard, screen, and they're trying to tunnel the into the mountain this way. And I'm trying to build up from the bottom. And they said, your way of, this is their proposal, you, Scott, your way of teaching is like, hey, you want to drive a car? Let's talk about internal combustion. Yeah. Maybe not the way to do things. I, I, I will agree with your intern that when I teach, I teach from the top down. Okay. Because it, it frustrates me that 
a lot of electronics the way it's historically been taught, and there's nothing wrong with it, but I just, I personally didn't like it, was here's an electron. It's like you exactly. never actually have to deal with an electron at any point in doing electronics yeah. until you get to something that is not working because of some model that you don't understand. But in general, you're not really dealing with that stuff. Yeah. And I think the same thing for developers. So like somebody who's learning to program now does not know the difference between cache memory, RAM memory, you know, disk network. They 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 don't and they shouldn't. Yes, some, it, it'll affect the speed at which things run, but as us old people shaking our fists in the clouds have learned, um, you know, the root of all evil is premature optimization. So, mm -hmm. so maybe they're right. You know, maybe get your, you know, what people say, the minimum viable product, get that going. And yes, it will not be very fast because they're not, they're not using the optimization systems that they should to, to get the performance that you eventually do need to add. Yeah. Um, but they they just don't understand. Knowing that may not be necessary. Um, another thing I've noticed is like engineers often have, because they have so much knowledge of what is the right way to do something and what is the, the correct abstraction is that they get engineers paralysis where they can't make forward motion because they're just like, okay, I do it this way, but the real way to do it is that way. But then like, now I have to like, it, they, 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 That's my they life. Just, yeah, there, there's actually too much, too much going on. And um, one of the things that I have to do when I'm managing folks like that is like, try to break it down and just say like, you have to do this one piece in one step. And they're like, that's not the right way to do it. And I'm like, look, all code gets refactored. So let's just, let's just get something working because we don't know what we don't know about this system yet. Like you think, you know, like you think, Oh, my bottleneck is going to be this, but it could be something different. And like, you also don't like you, you know, sometimes you're like, you're programming something and you don't realize that that data isn't accessible to you mm -hmm. or like, you know, like this, this kernel does it one way, but the other kernels do it another way. And you're not going to be able to depend on it anyhow. So like sometimes you have to make the wrong decisions right. to get the right outcome. So like the file system on CircuitPython, for example, like you said, you plug it in, it shows the disk drive, right? So it's, it's a FAT file system. It's actually like FAT12 or FAT16 or something, right? And that's like the wrong thing to do, right? If you ask any engineer, what is the correct file system to put on a flash memory that does not have where leveling, They'll say, oh, you should absolutely use LittleFS or some journaling file system because, you know, if you're running fat, your first sector is going to be overwritten every single time and you're going to like burn out the memory, right? Because that's all they've learned is like, is, is this is the correct, technically correct thing. And my answer is like, yeah, but like, it's going to be a really long time until that happens. And so we're going to make the decision to do something that is more user friendly, which is have. A, a fat exposed file system, even though technically that is totally the incorrect answer. That it is not the proper file system to use on a, on a flash memory system. And we can always refactor it later when we feel like it, but not today. But that's what makes this magical, right? Like I don't need any drivers. I don't need to go and confuse, worry that my, my version of Windows or my version of Mac or whatever is not going to work. Like it just works. Mass storage is the one thing that every computer has a built-in driver for. Believe me, even HID, you can't you can't depend or trust it. USB CDC also doesn't always, but mass storage, everything knows about mass storage. Everything. It is the it is the universal um, way of interacting with computers. And so why I'm like really into mass storage as a method of of programming. And actually, I'm gonna give a mega shout out to the folks at um, Microsoft Research who designed um, UF2, which is the bootloader system that we use with CircuitPython, which shows up as a mass storage drive and you drag over a hex file. They actually figured out how to do it. And and what's, you know, this is like, again, this is the, the technical thing that I thought was really brilliant is people have done programming chips via mass storage where you drag a file over. It's, this is not new. This has happened before. However, Every operating system handles, even though they know about mass storage, they write things out of order because there's like, 
caching that's happening underneath. So it's like they try to be smart. So like Linux always starts at the beginning and writes a full file. And like Mac, it's like they always have these dot files that, that you know, dot 7FS, whatever, that they write at the same time. And then like Microsoft does it with like sector change, whatever. Everyone's trying to do their own implementation. And that actually would really mess up bootloaders because they, they couldn't cope with the fact that all the files, the files would come in out of order. It didn't start at, at byte zero and write. That's not how files are written on a mass storage file system. It's actually written out of order. And um, they came up with, uh, again, they, they were like, well, what if we just make everything twice as big and then we pad it out so it doesn't matter what order it's written in. And again, this is like, it's a great engineering decision that is wrong, right? right. The it's right thing to do. There's all kinds of reasons it, we could throw pebbles yeah, at it and like, say that was it, dumb. inefficient, but they're like, who cares? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, it's fine. Memory is infinite. Just use it. <laughs> That's a t-shirt now. Yes. Memory is, is memory, memory is basic on a computer. Memory is basically infinite. Like, Tell you that guys to the people have, who run like Slack and <laughs> Chrome. <laughs> well, but you know what? It <laughs> kind of is though. It kind of is, right? I mean, like what's, what's the point of having these, these computers? I mean, like Dropbox was written in Python. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it matters, but maybe it doesn't matter. So trying to apply some of these lessons to life, it makes me think about what I'm trying to tell my 15-year-old who has no interest in computers and wants to be a script writer for TV. Ooh. And he gets analysis paralysis, like you've described, where yeah. he will talk about a script for months. But not actually write it. Freaking write it down. And I said, yeah. I said, dude, because that's how I talk to my 15-year-old, just slap the keyboard. Just start slapping the key. Well, but it, you know, the care, he's coming up with all these different reasons. It's like, he's I want got, him to get into the feedback loop. Write a first he's draft. He's got fear. He's got, the, he's got fear right now. Yeah. yeah he wants he to write the final on one try. Yeah. He's scared of what if it doesn't come out right. Yeah. And that fear is the, is the biggest. And that's what engineering paralysis is the same thing. It's like the fear of doing something. And it, it you didn't do a good job the first time because there's this myth of, you know, the first time you you do something, it's going to be perfect. And mm. I don't know the answer for this. Um, well, we perpetuate that myth when we talk about 10X programmers and people who imply that like, oh, the demo worked on the first try. That's one of the reasons when I do demos and stuff, I make them not work. Yeah. Because watching someone that you will follow on the internet stick the landing every time. Yeah. That's no fun. I want to yeah. see the feedback loop. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like one of the cool things about GitHub is you can see every commit, you can see every issue and they were closed. So you can, you know, you do see, you do have access to that. You don't just see the final software at the end, yeah. but the whole process that went through it, which is like totally gnarly. It's cool to watch you all go through your process um, on your YouTube and now on your TikTok, which I'm very, a big, a big fan of yeah. as you make things better. And then you have your team members make content and they go and build stuff and they do crazy, wacky, creative stuff. We had, we bought your Ada boxes and yeah. you had these wonderful googly eyes with screens on them. This is like, this is the best thing ever, by the way, this is a joy. I'm just going to like have a free advertisement for Ada boxes. Okay, good. Cause well, we have some slots left over, but it's, it is, it is a huge lift that we do every Is year. it really? Okay. Yeah, so these lift. are your, this is like the Columbia record club but electronics, surprise boxes that show up every couple of months with stuff in them. You never know what you're going to get. You open the box up. I've got like, like literally stacks of these things. They're actually becoming yeah. a problem. I have to have a whole separate room in the house for these. And they're and only quarterly. They're only quarterly. I've they're been there. I must have been there since box two because yeah, I have, have like 15 of these things. And you've seen the evolution, right? It started with like, you know, feather boards and you wrote stuff in Arduino and then we had circuit Python. And one of the things that, so the Ada boxes have turned into a way of, of um, bookmarking, earmarking, like the, the, we put a pin in a development that we want to achieve um, by the end of that quarter. So, um, one of my favorite descriptions of, of development and output is from Square Enix, who makes the Final Fantasy games. Mm -hmm. And like one of the people that I'm assuming it's from them because it's, it's, I associate, but somebody there said, somebody said, like, what's a Final Fantasy game? And they answered 
a Final Fantasy game is the best game we can make with the technology available mm -hmm. at publish time, right? Which is like not what you would say. You'd think like, oh, it's a Japanese RPG. So, you know, what I'm trying to do is like, what what is the technology that's available and what is like, what is the newest technology and what can I make with that newest technology to kind of introduce it and sort of force our hand to actually do a good support development system for it. So like um, there's this new chip from Espressif that does Wi-Fi at low cost. So the last few boxes have been using that chip and, and we've gotten better and better and better. Like we really wanted a low power. So it's like we did an e-ink project with oh, Wi-Fi because yeah. we're like, we're like, how can we force ourselves to, to finish this low power code? And it's like, well, we have a deadline yeah. with, um, that we're going to ship this box that has ink and it has to be low power and it sits on your fridge and it it's on my fridge right now. It's on my yeah, fridge. It's very handy. It's got so, our uh, to-do list. It's can Yeah. We have, a, and we have like a dozen different projects. You know, I have one that has like the weather thing and like the number of, you know, vaccinations in the U S like how, how far we've gotten along. So it it's, you know, that's how I, um, force, force the development and the release. Right. Cause, cause with, um, your kiddo, how do you get them into a development and release cycle when they have, they haven't been able to do that yet. And sometimes having event deadlines is good. Like, do you want to submit the script to this art fellowship or grant or whatever? Sometimes that's, that's needed. It is, it's like the, it's one of the things about people that's very tough because it in of itself you can't force the feedback loop for the feedback loop. It's like, how do you get somebody into a healthy feedback loop that isn't based on fear and like really bad self-esteem, <laughs> right? How do you, how do you make it healthy? That I don't know. Yeah. I haven't figured that out. that has been the out. challenge of parenting for the last 15 years is the, you know, you can do anything, set your mind to it and all the kind of typical parenting type things. But it's like, just slap the keyboard. We'll do draft one. We'll do draft 99. But his ideas are so great. You know, I always feel like that about these. Like I take my ADA boxes and I turn them into something and then I get it to 80%. And then that's where my paralysis happens. And then the analysis, I can get, I can get it crappy, but I can't spike the ball at the end zone and like do that's, the last. Yeah. And I think that's actually what management, that's what management is supposed to be. Right. Like that's how, because like I, I run this company and, and I try to, to, to get things to the end. It's the, it's the finishing, right? This is the, the hardest thing is to get it to the finish. And I kind of like my job is to like get people across the line to the finish because everyone loves to start the project, but I have to get them to finish it to the point where we can publish it. And um, I, I don't know any other way of doing it than, than having like these deadlines or events or just saying, Hey, this is, this is what I need. Sometimes you can like sweeten the deal. It's like, okay, after you finish this thing I need, you can do something you want, but you also have to finish it. But definitely if you have a gaggle of people without something to kind of, without that publication push, it's going to be very hard for people to iterate because right now, you, your kid isn't in the iteration cycle yet. He's he's swimming at the beginning. He needs to compile the code and see the output, even if it's a warning and full of errors. If you don't write that first few lines of code because you're so scared of the You've given me an error, idea. Yeah. I'm going to tell him if he gives me 30 pages, then I'll print it and bind it. Then he can hold it. And then he can do another one. That will give him a well, an arbitrary him, thing. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, is there is there anything he? I mean, he wants to he wants to screenwrite for television. Oh yeah, the, he he's he just sits there and he talks about like you know I don't like the way that the motivation of this character in this show. Da, 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 I, I think they should have done it like this. He's got amazing ideas, but but he he just it's it's a lot of talk. But then when he sits in front of Google Docs, he just paralyzes. Yeah. I wonder if it would be good for him to do like a voice. Yeah. Recording. Uh, of it. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, that's a great idea. I could uh, we could do a transcription thing. Tell the story and then take the voice note and do it. See, this is great. So what you're doing is you're managing me and you're yeah. encouraging me to think about I'm feedback trying, loops. Well, I'm trying to think about how you do it. You know, one one th one thing that um because I do a lot of writing is you know, first off I acknowledge that it's not going to be done. I, you know, I, I do some of the tricks like you start with the second paragraph. You know, you don't start with the, the first paragraph is the hardest to write. Ooh. 
So you start with the second paragraph. Just pretend, just skip right over the first paragraph. Skip do that over later. The first, yeah, yeah. Just skip over the beginning and go right to the middle. Go right to the exciting part, the meat of the, the meat of it, and then you go at the end. You and then it's it's easy because then you just have to yeah. like. Yeah, you do your explain. bookends later. Yeah, I remember like uh, I think you know Boing Boing used to the the zine, not the um, I think it was Boing Boing. They said you know we do, no sorry it was uh, Cool Tools. They said I think and they were like if you're going to write a review of a tool, um, write the review and then send us an email telling us why we should print your review and then delete the review and we'll publish the email. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's true though. The, the review is stilted. Yeah. It's like, how, how do you capture the, the energetic review? The, the, the thing that's, that's true, not the thing that you think people want to read. Very hard. This is, I think, I think it gets elevated. It's like you, you have to push through the discomfort of being human into like the truth of how you see something. Like, I don't know how to raise your kid though. This is your, totally your problem. No, I know. I'm on my, I'm on, like, that was the whole, <laughs> totally the whole thing own. was to sneak you into a podcast and then get parenting advice. Which no, I think was... <laughs> yeah. I, just, I, I, I don't know. I, it's very, it's, it's tough. I don't know. It's it, it, humans are squishy. It's humans uh, are very squishy. Yes. It's feedback systems. But you have to figure out what is it that they want? What is it that they're afraid of? And what, what makes them happy? And then it's easier for me because the people who I'm telling to do that, I pay them. And so that there, there is this, there's this <laughs> carrot is a, and stick. Nice. Yeah. It's like, if you don't do it, I can't keep paying you. So that's, it's, but you don't do that with your kid. Yeah. I'm always weirded. I mean, I know people are like, oh, I pay my kid to like do their homework. And I'm just always like, that's kind of like weird. No. But the people do it, right? I and guess. It's, like, it's the only thing that works. Um, I pay them I in think- Ada boxes right now, so. Yeah, that's good. I don't know. I'll think about what, how do you, how do you motivate someone to write? I mean, like, obviously this is like one of humanity's greatest challenges, right? It's the thing, right? It's the, I'm inspired. I want to do so many things, but then I'll do nothing, you know? And that's, that's okay though. I really, sometimes we just need to find our, our tribe, find our people and sit around and brainstorm together. Well, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you do it? Like what, what makes, what makes you that record is a po- why a do you record problem. a podcast every week? It is a problem. Okay. Well, it's-, <laughs> it's a problem because I'm vibrating with enthusiasm about the universe around me. Yeah. I, I tell this story about how when my wife's family came over from South Africa and they were sitting and they were all jet lagged and the kids were like, why is it light here? It should be dark. I feel weird. And I was like, oh, and I grab an orange. I'm like, okay, you hold this. You're the, you're the, the, the sun. And then I start building like a model of the, the, the solar system and fruit. And they're just like, just don't just, leave, just, just stop. leave us alone. Just stop leave it. Us alone. But how can you not be excited? So I just have that inner thing, and I don't know where it's from, and I can't give that to somebody for free. It's just everyone's wired differently. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you still, kind you... of made this in your dorm room, and now you have a company, and you're revolutionizing electronics for the world, and people of all ages are building stuff. You were obviously vibrating with the enthusiasm to do that. 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, but I'm like, I'm really motivated by hate. Like, it's not very healthy <laughs> and like very... Hate of what? The just very, lousy electronic companies? Yeah, I just really hate bad things. And I get so angry and like Phil does this to me on purpose. Like he purposefully like sends me... You know the people like smell this milk? It's terrible. He like sends me really bad engineering. And then he's just like, look <laughs> at this. And I'm like, that's so bad. And I'm like, I hate it. And he's and like, you yeah. you have to fix it. And I'm like, fuck, I have to fix it. And then I'm like, I have to, I'm so angry that I have to, I stay up late and I'm in the morning. I'm like, okay, I designed a better thing than, so they did it wrong. Right. I am trying to channel that like nerd judgmentalism. Yeah. Spike driven development. Very spike. It's like hate forking. Hate forking. Love love it. (laughs) You don't remember hate forking? Yeah. I love that. I mean, like that's half of like how things are done. And I, I think people don't admit that as much. I think there is, there is this like, Oh, love and creativity and sharing. It's like, <laughs> yeah, but there's also like the other side of the coin, which is that you, there's something that you hate. Oh, me, for me. See, you, just brought, you just brought up a great point. And I'm going to actually end on this because I just told you at the beginning that my son is really hates these, this show. Well, then you should write fanfic. You should do it differently. You should write fanfic. You should make it better. He should be like the number one fanfic writer. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, don't 
just be aware of what fanfic sites he's on. But like, no, you I know. understood. Understood. Yeah, I'm on them. Right. Like, we're thinking about the Marvel, Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan, positive fanfic kind of like. Yeah. Like, yeah. No. It's okay. Good. Um. Yeah. Just watch out for those Google searches. And yeah, have if if there's something that he hates, that hate hate is a very, very powerful motivator. I mean, like hate not hate like is a true hate, no, but just like. Yeah. You I don't like that I can make it better. You don't like something you can yeah. make it better. And I think I think that you know that some engineers say you know like, oh build an XYZ that doesn't suck, right? Everyone has the frustration of of dealing with or interacting with technology and they're like why is this so bad? <laughs> and why can't it be better? And then now you actually have the ability to maybe make it better. Very cool. Okay, driven feedback loops. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for our outro music. That's the new okay. outro music. Thank you so yeah, much, Lamour, for hanging out with me. No singing. <laughs> I appreciate you spending time with me today. All right. Well, this was fun. And uh, I th- sorry to everybody who had to listen to us. I think that for the three people that watched this all the way to the end, I appreciate them all. Love and uh, everything. And say hi to Philip for me, please. Easy. I'm- hi, Phil. He says hi. Okay. Hi, there he is, is, he gonna, is he going to stick his head you in? you want to come wave? See, wait, we're, we're, hi. We're, hi. hi. <laughs> I am continually amazed, impressed, and inspired by a lot of things you do. So please continue to do it because it's lonely out here doing all this stuff. You're, so. you're pretty awesome too, Phil. Thank you. You're awesome, sir. He says you're awesome. <laughs> all right. Okay. This, I'm going to do my outro now. Okay? okay, do your outro. This is where the radio voice. Mm, mm. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>